Hey, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics of interest to that may be of interest to libraries. The show is broadcast live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week and it is then posted onto our website for you to watch later. And I will show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of those archives. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch, so please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone who you think might be interested in any of the topics that we've had on the show. Um, we have a, um, people from all over the country attending our shows here. So um, just so you know, here at the Nebraska Library Commission, we are the state agency for libraries in the state of Nebraska. Um, similar to other states where it would be the um, so-and-so state library, we're the library commission. So we provide services and training and education and um, consulting to um, all types of libraries across the state. So um, both. So there will be uh, topics on our show that are for public libraries, K-12, um, academic, special, corrections. Um, I probably missed some. <laughs> Anything you think of that has a library, <coughs> we serve them. And our shows here will um, run the gamut of all of that as well. Um, we do a mixture of things here, of types of presentations, book reviews, interviews, um, mini training sessions, demos of services and products that we think may be of interest to librarians um, and library staff. We do sometimes have Nebraska Library Commission staff come on and do things that are specific to what we're doing here uh, through the Commission for Libraries, but we also bring in guest speakers. And that's what we have this morning on the line with us um, from just a little bit up the road in Omaha, from Omaha <laughs> Public Library is Russ Harper. Good morning, Russ. Good morning. And he is there. Uh, what is your actual title there? I don't know if it's Youth Librarian or Youth Services. Uh, it's actually... Um... Right now, it's Youth Services Library Specialist, which is a big, long way to say the teen guy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So, um, and he has this presentation. Um, he's going to talk to us today about graphic novels um, and collection, um, collecting and programming. Uh, this is a session that Russ actually did last year at our, we have a youth services retreat here in Nebraska every year. That's correct, right? Is where you did this previously? Yes. 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 Okay. And, um, I did not attend that. I was not able to attend that, but had great reviews. And I wanted to make sure we could share it with anyone else, anyone who wasn't able to attend that. So I invited him to come on the show. And so we are going to learn um, all about graphic novels, everything you ever wanted to know in just an hour. No pressure. <laughs> well, I'm not sure I'll be able to cover quite that extensively, but I'll I'll give it a I'll give it a go. Great. All right. So go ahead, take it away, Russ. Okay. Um, well, like Chris said, my name's Russ Harper, and I have worked for the Omaha Public Library for um, clo close to 18 years. I started in the year 2000, and I have been focused on teen programming for about the last 10, 15 years. Um, this is actually a, a good match for me, too, because um, in my hobbies and growing up and, and still today, I do collect uh, comics and graphic novels and draw some stuff on the side, not anything that's... Uh, going anywhere, but it's a fun hobby. Um, today, what we're going to do is I'm going to cover three different things, basically. Um, the main part, which I think is probably why you're watching, is the first part, which is the collection development. How do you find graphic novels? Um, you know, what are graphic novels? How do you use them in the libraries? Um, number two is a part that I'm continually cutting down, the short history and current trends. Uh, it's a part that, you know, uh, pleases my little geeky heart, so I can go a long time for that. <laughs> which is why the collection development part is first. Um, and then thirdly, uh, just a real quick hit on some programming ideas that I've had success with in the past. I'm not going to get really in depth there, um, but there's, you know, there's tons of stuff online at all, all times, but I'll, I'll tell you about some things that I think really do work well for, for libraries as far as graphic novels are concerned. But first, um, there is some confusion. What is a graphic novel? Um, the term was specifically used and coined by Will Eisner, um, who was a graphic artist from the 40s through the uh, beginning of this, this century before he passed away. Um, the, the industry awards, the Eisner Awards, are named for him. Mm -hmm. um, so he's very, you know, he's very well known in, in the industry, but he wrote a contract with God, which he described as the first graphic novel. Um, that's... He, 
a little bit of here or there. He he obviously latched onto it, and it, and it was a great kind of marketing, uh, you know, phrase for him. But other people have been used, you know, graphic novels, graphic fiction, comic fiction. Th those words had been kind of used in combination before, just not really prominently out there like that. Um, but graphic novels, you know, it, it's still a misnomer because it can be nonfiction too. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's either you know it, it's the it, graphic novels is a is a is a form of a media. It's not an it's not a genre. A lot of people talk about the graphic novel genre. Well, when you have something that encompasses superheroes, real life, science fiction, romance, horror, western, I think we've covered lots of genres, but that's still just the one media. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and loosely graphic novels, as I say there at the bottom of the slide, can be defined as long comics, um, because it's still using the same medium, that comics medium. Mm -hmm. Fine. Uh, but you might ask, what is, what are comics? Well, comics, which is often used as a singular noun, is otherwise known as sequential art, which is one of Eisner's terms. It's a specific art form that combines words and pictures to tell a story or communicate an idea. Now, usually they're told in panel to panel transition within a single page or and also have dialogue and word bubbles. However, and again, this is where it gets gray. There are comics and graphic novels that are wordless, bubbleless and panelless, but still fit that definition of what a graphic novel or what comics are. Um, again, it's it's a art form, not a genre. You can literally tell any type of story with comics or graphic novels. And yet another confusing thing. Comics and cartoons are often used interchangeably, but at least for my purposes, cartoon refers more to a style of art within a graphic novel and within comics and within animation rather than that art form itself. Um, this is a good time for me to pause and see if there are any questions. I do have a question. Russ. Okay. Um, is something I was wondering how what you were going to do about defining uh, graphic novels. Um, I also am a um, me my husband and I are huge comics uh, collectors as well. Um, not artists like you. We don't have that kind of time. <laughs> but, um, we've got the long boxes. Both of us our own sets of those in our house uh -huh. where we collect them. Um, and I was wondering. <laughs> Comics in the individual issues that come out like once a month or every other month, whatever, are sometimes collected into a larger book. Right. Collection. Yeah. Um, so then, for example, like, you know, volume one of um, Batgirl New 52 is the first, you know, six issues of that. Mm -hmm. Would that be considered a graphic novel or something different? Because... Or is it like the story needs to be encompassed in that one book and not continue off somewhere else still? Right. What would you think and of that? This is where you're getting into that hazy definition. It is, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's the thing, especially with the with the monthly superhero stuff, a lot of times they do have like a single story arc within their first, say, six issues that get collected into a graphic novel. Correct, um, yeah. I just, I find the word graphic novel itself to be very problematic because... Mm -hmm. It has that word novel there that has lots of baggage and implies something that is Which not. Which leads people in the wrong direction to start with, right. yeah. Like you um, said, the fiction versus nonfiction. Right. And then also the word graphic can get us in trouble because especially if you have a, a parent who does not know what a graphic novel is, they mm -hmm. don't want to be handing something, quote, graphic to their little oh. ones. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and that's, sure, that's sure. tripped us up before. Um, yeah. There's really no great word that describes this art form mm -hmm. better than graphic novel, but graphic novel is really not the best word for it. Yeah, um, something you so, still need to figure out, I guess, or just go with whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't like the word graphic novel as far as that's the end all be all, this is what it's called, because like I said, if it's a nonfiction book, how does how is that a novel? Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know if there's any better words for it. So yeah, I would say, at least by those loose definitions, uh, that first collected Batgirl title would be a graphic novel. Mm. And um, potentially for librarians who are trying to get into this for the first time, they maybe don't want to be too picky about it. They want to get, and I'm sure you're going to get into this, but they want to get, what do my my users want? Right, right. Um, yeah, and I, I wouldn't get too hung up on what is a graphic novel. If, if it, if it, you know, if it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, and it looks like comics, it's comics. Yeah, <laughs> and it's a bigger um, and, thing that will actually hold up better in your library because it's in that physical form as a hardcover or softcover book. That's better than those individual issues, anyways. Right, right, and that's yeah. 
that's a graphic novel as far as I'm concerned. Um, but like I said, that that definition is very nebulous and, and, mm -hmm. and can be really twisted around a lot of different ways. Okay, great. Uh, anybody else does have any questions, go ahead and type them into the questions section or let me know that you have a mic and we will um, do it that way and you can ask your questions. All right, go ahead, Russ. Okay. So the first part, collection development. Um, this is the big kind of, uh, as far as the ideas that you take away, whatever they are, hopefully it'll be in this first section. Um, a lot of resources these days, a lot more honestly than there were 10 or 15 years ago for librarians in this. Um, the first one is a brand new working group that has been formed by the ALA called the Graphic Novels and Comics Books Roundtable. And I'm just going to click that link there so you can get to their page. It'll eventually come up. There we go. Yep, there you um, go. <clears throat> I'm not logged in right now, and I, honestly, I'm, I'm one of those horrible people that pays their dues when they have to go to a conference. So <laughs> I, I do – the nice thing is that when you have signed up for this or get signed up for it like I was, um, you do get a digest version of what's going on in the community every day. So I do feel like I'm still keeping tabs on what's happening, even if I can't quite – openly contribute to the conversation sometime. Um, and I do recognize a lot of the folks that are, are running these, uh, the, the graphic novels and comic books uh, roundtable. They are the people that have really been doing graphic novels and comic books in libraries for years and years and years. So they're, it's a good working group. Um, but yeah, you will, you will hear as, as subjects of this conversation, you know, new hot titles, um, new, you know, new things to discuss just because they are always bringing things up. Whoops, I'm going mm -hmm. one step ahead. I know um, they do also have a Facebook group for it as well. So if you wanted to, um, for the roundtable. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So um, if you're not an ALA member, but you still want to keep tabs maybe in, or in between when your memberships, <laughs> <laughs> um, that they do, you can just go and search them and they do have, I'm a member of the group that they do have. Yeah. Um, and the other, the other great ALA resource, at least for teens, um, is Yalsa. And every year they come up with this list of great graphic novels for teens. And usually there are like literally hundreds of books on here. And you can see all the different years in the past. And then from this list, they do select a list of the top 10, the teen top 10 graphic novels every year. Um, but if you want to get a huge list, let me just look at... Like, here's 2017. Look how long this thing is. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, if, if you're looking for resources, this is another place to find great lists for that. Um, you know, the, the other thing, though, is that if you are. You know, OK, so the, the, here's the next slide. Um, no flying, no tights. But <laughs> the. the um, you know, you have all those big, huge lists from Yalsa and from other places, and you wonder, how am I ever going to figure out what actually I should put in my library? Here's the, in my, in my opinion, the kind of secret weapon for librarians. No Flying, No Tights um, was started by Robin Brenner, who actually is one of the people leading the charge on the uh, ALA's graphic novel roundtable. Um, this is a review site for libraries about graphic novels, comic books, manga, and anime. So you can find weekly, if not daily, reviews. And not just the little short snippets, the more more kind of the, the publisher's weekly style reviews where they do, you know, get into a little bit of the details and, and, and talk about that. These are reviews that I trust. And I should say that with a, with a slight buyer beware, I used to review for this site. Um, but they are, they really have their finger on the pulse of what's happening in the comics world at all times. Plus, they always try to translate it for library folks, um, which is great uh, when you're trying to, you know, build your collection. Another thing that they have done, and I don't know if they do these annually or not, but they did do them a couple of years ago. Um, they do come out with core title lists. Um, for each age group. Now, I only included the children's title list and the uh, teens title list since that was kind of my focus for the subject, but they do have an adult one too. And honestly, if you go down this list, you know, I, I could yell names and authors to you for a half an hour. They're almost all on here, the ones that I would yell anyway. 
if I was going to come up with my core recommendations list, I don't think I could do much better than what's on the NF, the NFNT no flying, no tights list. Um, and that's really, you know, when, when people ask me, what, what are my, what are my recommendations? I say, well, go, go to these people and look at this list because they really do know what they're talking about. Um, the other nice thing is obviously on that list, they have links to all the reviews. So you can see the original reviews that they themselves have originally done. Any questions so far? Um, we don't have any questions yet. We do have someone that did comment just saying, woohoo comics. Um, <laughs> <laughs> cool. Someone's saying, not a question, but uh, thank God that graphic novel and trade paperback are interchangeable. They're glad. Yes. They're, yeah, that's what we were talking about before. Yeah. 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 The, 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 the publishers call them the trade paperbacks. And exactly. that's the word yeah. I was looking for. Yeah. <laughs> And the libraries want to call them graphic novels. And yeah, they're the same thing. <laughs> yeah. It's really confusing, but they're the same thing. Um, so the next place that I go to find information on graphic novels and comics is kind of into comics land itself. Diamond Distributors got its start in the 70s, um, sending comics to independent comic stores. And I, I describe them here as the kind of Ingram and Baker and Taylor for independent comic shops. In other words, these are the people that that the comic stores order their comics from. And they have started more and more to pay attention to libraries and market to libraries, too. For instance, Diamond Bookshelf is a monthly newsletter. Um, and as it says right there, graphic novel resource for educators and librarians. Now, one little thing, you know, this, this is a great place to go both for, you know, again, articles on upcoming things and also, whoops, I keep clicking the wrong thing. Um, they do have monthly bestseller lists, both for the graphic novels or the trade paperbacks right here. And that, I think this connects to an old one. Yeah, to July. Um, and if those of you who downloaded my link sheet, there isn't a link to the uh, to the actual lists. But if you um, click this first link, the, the bookshelf thing and. Oh, it's not there. Well, they do have core list lesson plans. At one point, I could click on this and find the monthly. Uh, Top 100 graphic novels. I it's over here on the on the left hand side. Well, it, um, it yeah. said it right at the top of that page, but oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it says it right here, but this is like, like yeah. This is for the over month. to July for that yeah. month. Um, but yeah, if you wander on their little website, it's it's a lot easier than I'm making it seem here. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, but this does have the top 100 graphic novels sold in July, um, or in whatever month you're looking for. Uh, they do also do the monthly titles, and this is what in the industry are called the floppies or the single issues. Um, but again, you can kind of look at that and see the trends of what's going to be probably collected into the hot graphic novel once once that story arc is done. Um, again, a little bit of buyer beware, um, where the New York Times for a while had a graphic novels bestseller list and they no longer do. Um, you know, you would think that this is a, this might be a good substitute, um, but Really, this only focuses on um, the superhero folks. This this only focuses on the actual comics publishers, not so much the independent um, voices that are being heard more and more these days that are being put out through more traditional publishing houses. Um, but as far as what's what's going on in the superhero and on that side of it, uh, Diamond Distributors will give you a very good look at um, you know, and then you got to realize also these are sales numbers. These are not necessarily uh, you know anything besides that but it does give you a good idea for what the at least the superhero trends are um and i say i i say superhero but that's really superhero companies uh those companies do a lot more than just superheroes but of course they all go into the same comic shops any questions so far as far as you know where to find information about building your core lists for libraries those are the resources that i really rely on and again, mm -hmm. I I could you know shout individual titles to you until the cows come home, but I can do that you know literally for days, and you're not going to get <laughs> you're not going to get much out of that. Yeah. Um, so hopefully this this will give you a little you know better resources to kind of tie on to. Mm -hmm. We do have one question. Um, are there any resources for French comics? 
recommendation oh. websites. And I'm not sure if she means in French or from coming from French authors. I don't know if you want to clarify, but I don't know in of French. Anything. Yes, in actually French. in the yeah. French language. Foreign language comics. I wish I had something. I really don't. Um, yeah. There is I'm trying to think of the publisher name. There is a publisher that does do a lot of uh, French, especially translations into English. I, I want to say it's NBM or something like that. Um, but but I, again, they, they are translating, you know, European comics into English. So, I you know, your question mm -hmm. about in French, I really don't have anything for that. I, I apologize. Hmm. That's a that's a hard question. And wow, <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> You said so I'm assuming there's a French speaker that wants more graphic novels, and I, I, I'm not sure. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, we'll see if we can find anything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah group, group mind is, is good for that sort of stuff. Okay, part two, and yeah, I will go on on this. So uh, let me get my my clock out now so that I can make sure that we we uh, do this in in a timely manner. I see basically three streams of you know and this is my own idea this is not i didn't get this from anywhere so whatever crackpot theory is totally mine um but i basically see libraries coming from three streams of of graphic novel producers uh the first one and the most prominent one is the american newspaper and comics and comic book industry which really started in the 1930s as a book sort of publishing thing uh, the second one is Japanese manga, which started for them in the 1950s. And then uh, the translation started hitting us in the 90s. And then number three, the original longer works and or web comics and some European comics, mainly the personal quirky individual voices that don't necessarily get picked up by a company, um, but are doing their own thing and doing their own graphic works. It's really a, a combination, and those kind of cross pollinate each other. And I'll and I'll kind of try to show that as as I talk about this. Um, those three are really how we get graphic novels in library. Uh, but before that, there are some sequential art examples even before. For instance, Egyptian hieroglyphics. Uh, if anybody's familiar with the Bayou Tapestry, and I will let you Google that. <laughs> um, those are sequential art. They read from point A to point Z and you and tell a story. Um, you know, people don't consider that comics or or graphic novels or anything. No, but if your definition is a little broader, what sequential art is, then realize that those are kind of the ancestors of comics as we know it. Um, and then they started taking the book form back in the 1830s with R Rudolf Telfer's. I'm not going to read the French title because I will destroy that. Um, but it did get published into the United States in the 1840s as the Adventures of Mr. Obadiah Oldbuck. And if you if you Google Topher, his his uh, cartoons are very fun, very loose, and the stories are kind of uh, goofy. And he was just kind of he was playing around, and all of a sudden found this thing that people liked. Uh, more prehistory as American journalism gets its start in the late 1800s, early 1900s. You had Hearst and Pulitzer both trying very hard to draw readers away from each other. And with the new color supplements that happened in the 1890s with things like the Yellow Kid, which is in that first uh, top caricature, um, those were big draws to newspapers. People, uh, they, they actually hired artists away from each other just because that was the draw to, to the readership at the time. Um, now, most of these did not have any sort of sequential uh, plot line past the day of the cartoon. Um, but there are some, like Little Nemo is a great example, um, that did have a, a, a weekly to monthly continuity that, well, again, when they get collected, and, and believe me, if, if you haven't yet, go see Windsor McKay's uh, works collected. They're just gorgeous, and they're from the early 1900s. And he was doing things there that are still ex considered experimental today. Um, last little bit before we get into actual uh, comic books. Uh, in the 1920s and 30s, comics continued to be collected after the fact from newspaper strips and given away mainly. Uh, there was, a, you know, they finally decided, hey, let's make some new stuff, especially for comic books. And that first one is the famous funnies thing that you see there in 1934. Um, but what most people don't realize is that graphic novels and that as an art form were out of the comics world even back in the 1920s. Lind Ward did a series of woodcut novels, which were wordless, um, 
that really read as a graphic novel and they're they're very <laughs> they're very dark i've only read one but it's it's a uh, it's a very atmospheric work and it's a very mature work and and he's you know one of the first people to do a, a publication like that um, that's really where that third independent voice stream kind of starts. But first, it kind of gets drowned out in the 40s by the golden age of comics. This is when Superman got his start. Um, other notable heroes, Batman, Wonder Woman, Captain America, Captain Marvel, who is going to be the subject of a movie this spring, by the way, under the name of Shazam, by the way, not the Marvel Captain Marvel, but the DC Comics Captain Marvel, who is now known as Shazam. Um, copyright battles back and forth make things totally confusing. <laughs> um, also, Will Eisner got his start in the spirit, and he actually did that as a as a 16-page insert into newspapers. And as it, as the war ended, and uh, publishers were trying to find how to keep their their audience, which already was mainly adult audience, even though it was marketed towards kids. Um, you know, the, and because it was marketed towards kids, the, the biggest sellers were Mickey Mouse and Bugs Bunny cartoon comic books, even beyond the superheroes. Pe yeah, that, that story gets missed. Um, but then in the late 40s, you know, as trying to keep their adult readership, they really expanded genre wise into, well, honestly, more adult topics, things like war comics, crime comics, romance, Archie, teen humor got its start around here, and also Tales from the Crypt, which you've probably heard of. Um, the horror, the horror comics, which led to, believe it or not, just like video games and, and television and everything else, there were actual, there were actual, um, I am not presenting this anymore for some reason. Okay. There were actual co um, congressional hearings and the comics industry decided at the end of these hearings to self-censor itself. And they created the Comics Code Authority. Um, and this, honestly, in my opinion, took American comics and basically made them stagnate for about 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, because you could not tell the kind of stories you wanted to tell necessarily. Otherwise, the distributors would literally not deliver your comics. Without this co Comics Code Authority stamp, you couldn't do that, you know, and, and, and you can see what some of the, the interesting things, you know, permutations of that were. The good guys always had to win. Crime and horror could not be in the title anymore. Uh, you could not depict blood. You could literally not depict human sweat. Um, it, it was crazy. And, and the comics industry did that to themselves. <laughs> This was not this was not the government saying the comics had to do. The comics decided we're going to make this all right, and and they did this to themselves. Um, and at the end of it, in the late fifties, the only superheroes that still had their own uh, comics were Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman. Everybody else, uh, you know, the stories were no good anymore. The there wasn't you know the conflicts were almost fake conflict. Everybody was a big happy family all the time. Um, it just you know the the. It was just kind of pablum. That's what that's what it turned into. Until uh, DC got this idea to kind of you know the new atomic age, they kind of worked that into their comics, and so Flash got a reboot. Pretty soon, the Justice League of America came out. And now we're into the Silver Age, and of course, Marvel. It's amazing how many titles Marvel came out with in their first five years that are still going concerns today that are in the movies now. Um, you know, Stan Lee and all the artists who work with him, who, who often don't get as much credit as he did, really did an amazing job at, at bringing in, you know, reality back into uh, the superhero comics and also being a, figuring out how to tell stories within the constraints of those comics code that still were engaging, compelling stories, mainly by making their characters more like real humans. And, you know, the big thing about Marvel is that Marvel... Marvel heroes fought with each other about little petty things where in DC it was kind of all everybody was a big happy family. <laughs> um, also in the 60s, uh, I don't have any great examples of this, but below there, you know, notice underground comics started at this time, which were adult oriented comics. They were not used in the, uh, the, they were not part of the distribution system. They promoted sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Um, but they also were, again, part of that third stream, that individual voice, the kind of, um, you know, different personal 
stories that that weren't being told by you know the the corporate comics at the time um and also they didn't have to worry about the comics code authority because they weren't getting their books sent through those distributors in the bronze age um the comics code authority got a little bit weakened down uh the the uh the government actually asked stanley to publish an anti-drug spider-man story and he couldn't put the code on it because it talked about drugs <laughs> literally that's what happened so he decided to publish mm -hmm. it without the code um they also did cute cutesy little things like uh well he can't show zombies but marvel has these weird things that are voodoo zuvembies uh, which somehow looked exactly like zombies <laughs> so, so they did so they they kind of you know softened the code a little bit and they found creative ways around it until finally it just kind of became a paper tiger in the late 70s uh early 80s um also underground comics began to grow up and and those head shops that you know were were there to to uh deal to hippies all of a sudden realized we can expand a little bit and become a comics shop and they did that and the 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 distributors that started that became just diamond distributors started doing more of the uh, mainstream comics um and this is how will eisner when he wrote that graphic novel a contract with god in 1978 that's how he was able to get it out because of course the traditional publishers didn't care anything about this sort of stuff so these are all kind of small press independent publishers and artists figuring out how to get their works out to the public and and in the late 70s that became the small little comic shop that is still a going concern for a lot of places today then what they call the modern age 1985 on how are we doing on time okay we're doing okay on time. um these three books are really what got the uh the mainstream press into comics watchmen um the Dark Knight Returns by Frank Miller about Batman's later years, and then Art Spiegelman's Mouse, again, proving that comics can be about anything that is a memoir of uh, his parents' experience in World War II. And it's a very gripping, personal, touching uh, memoir of, you know, uh, in, in history of the concentration camps. That's just, uh, it, it's still, every time I go back to it, you know, it's one of those things you find something new. Um, the Watchmen is the same way. Every time you go back, to that, that thing is like, uh, um, you know, one of these uh, puzzle boxes. Every time you open it, there's something new inside. Um, you know, and, and the thing is, is it shows how we've grown up as libraries. I remember when Watchmen used to be thrown into the teen area because that's where all the comics went. Hmm. <laughs> Maybe you should read it first. <laughs> yeah, really should read it first. You know, and, and people say, oh, it's the best comic ever written. Everybody should read it. Uh, okay, I, I can see people who can make that argument, and you can make that argument, but but handing that to someone who doesn't know anything about comics and saying, this is the best comic ever, read it, is like handing somebody who just has learned the, the English language, James Joyce's Ulysses, and says, this is the best novel ever, read it. Um, this thing is dense. It's it's not It's not an approachable book. It is something that once your comics literacy is up then go read it because then you'll you'll catch on a lot more of the depth and, and the subtlety that alan moore and david gibbons did in, in in the watchman um but because of these three works for probably the first time in america suddenly crap comics and graphic novels are respectable in national media you know you get time starting to cover ma graphic novels you you see this in entertainment weekly at this time they start paying attention that sort of thing um then in the 90s, this is uh, the collector's moon bust in the early 90s where all the publishers realized, they, hey, they had something here, this grim and gritty stuff that, that Frank Miller introduced. And they started coming out with special covers and paying attention to the artwork and not paying attention to the stories at all. So you had all these collectors buying all these alternate covers and then the market just crashed. Um, during this time, Image Comics, a lot of the hot artists decided to make their own com company with their, where they could keep their own rights to their creations, so that they, so that uh, things like Superman, you know, would not become the company's property, but would stay the artist's property. Uh, you also had Neil Gaiman start his Sandman run in 1989 through 1996. Um, his comic is one of the first that really turned adult women into comics readers. Uh, then you had Jeff Smith's Bone, which everybody thinks was a, is a scholastic stand standby now, 
Um, those all started as single issue black and white comics back in the 90s. And then the last thing, at least in my mind, uh, as far as publications that really had an effect, um, Scott McCloud's Understand Comics came, comes out in 1993. Um, and I will say, if, if you want to know more about the medium, if you're unsure about the comics medium and how it works and how to read a comic and all the different little tricks and, and, and tips that, that comics artists use to, to engage you, Scott McCloud's understanding comics will kind of peel off that layer, and it's it's like taking a college course into comics theory. Um, and the best part is, it's a comic, so uh, it's it's very accessible and it's it's a fun read. Last but not least, and this is that second stream, is the manga invasion that happens in the late nineties. The late nineties, and you guys probably remember when Borders was around, and Borders had the huge manga section. Ah, uh, Borders, yes. <laughs> yeah, and that that was a that was a going concern up until about oh 2003 or so um it was very successful publishers you know a lot of publishers jumped in on that game without realizing you know what was happening with their fan demographic because japanese fans and and by extension uh, american fans of japanese media are very participatory in their properties in other words they if if there's not a japanese um translation out yet a super fan will take care of that and post it online. And that's actually kind of encouraged by the uh, p by the folks in Japan. And, and here's why. Um, you know, this is this is the reason, at least in my opinion, why the boom and why the bust for American publishers. Why why do the Japanese artists let so many of these scan sites exist online? Um, one answer is Comiket. Now, Comiket is a comics convention in Japan that happens twice a year it has over 500,000 attendees every time if not a million um, it's about twice the size honestly of the san diego comic con and they do it twice a year and it's not even for what we would call real comics it's for doshinji which are fan fiction derivative works on existing properties that are encouraged by the artist and the publishers because it helps get the word out about their original properties. These conventions, though, um, like in 2008, um, the the uh, they did a study on the super fan or otaku industry, and the gross revenue from the sales of Doshinji, in other words, that fan fiction, were 27.73 billion yen or 14.9 percent of their total expenditure for the year. Hmm. It is not, you know, mm -hmm. fan fiction is not um, poo pooed on. It is encouraged. It is, you know, there are existing manga artists that got their start basically copying and doing fan fiction of their of their favorite things. And these these conventions are basically boosts and boosts and boosts of people doing their fan fiction and selling them there. It's just a whole different attitude on intellectual property rights. A whole different attitude on what it means to be a fan, a whole different attitude on, you know, how to be a good fan. A good fan will help other fans read this property by by translating it before the company can. The companies have caught on to this now, and now um, the English and Japanese editions of, of uh, each chapter of the manga group, um, the, the manga titles now pretty much drop on the same day. Um, so they've they've cut out, you know, the illegal you know, scanning, they haven't cut it out, but they, you know, they've at least minimized its effect. But in the process of learning that re lesson, a lot of U.S. publishers uh, went belly up because, you know, fans could read the free translations online. Mm -hmm. But it's still, you know, it, it, it influenced, I don't know how many U.S. artists, especially, you know, starting in the late 90s, um, you know, through the last decade. And Oh geez, we're already on programming ideas, but um, <laughs> but you know the independent artists, and I don't go a lot into that because there's again so many voices and so many different things. Um, but people like Raina Tegelmeyer, people um, I'm trying to think of other names to drop. Uh, Hope Larson, um, Faith Aaron Hicks. These are all folks that you know grew up reading those manga and realize I can have my own individual voice. 
uh, just like these manga artists do. And and they are really dry, you know, and, and now that the publishers are paying attention with, you know, the success of things like Alison Bechtel's Fun Home Memoir and, you know, other important graphic works, you know, the, the mainstream publishers are also letting these independent voices be published and get into regular bookstores and into our libraries. Um, so, you know, I really think that those three streams, the American comics industry, the Japanese manga industry, and now the now, you know, for the past 10, 15 years, burgeoning independent authorship voices in, Amer in America, I think all three of those are kind of cross-pollinating each other now and, now, and it's kind of a really fun time to get into graphic novels. Um, just as kind of a, just kind of an, as an example, uh, you might have heard of the unbeatable squirrel girl. If not, you should have heard of her by now. Um, yeah. she is, a, she is a fun, 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 tongue in cheek, Marvel character title, uh, humor really appeals to teen girls a lot. Cause she's just, she, uh, she's great, but she's being written right now by Ryan North who got his start. If you go to K qwantz.com quants.com you will see a weird thing called dinosaur comics and that is a web comic that ryan north has been doing for about 15 years now and on the basis of doing that and a couple side projects based on that he's not writing a marvel comic <laughs> you never know how you'll get your foot in the door yeah yeah and it's that's just awesome. it's, that's that, and, and and I've seen that so many. There there's this great uh, Eisner winning series called Lumberjanes. That's that's uh, geared uh -huh. towards towards um, I would say fourth grade girls and up like fourth grade through teen girls. And you know they won Eisner awards and and you know they obviously made a big enough splash that DC had let them cross over that independent property with one of their Batman properties. Just just for fun, just to publish kind of a, a one shot kind of. Uh, story but using all those characters together you know and that that's i i all i know is that if i was the creator of lumberjanes i would have been over the moon <laughs> off the walls oh yes yeah <laughs> it's so, the fans getting to be part of the big guys but right and right the big yeah. guys marvel dc recognizing that these are valid good um yeah, the, that, and, and the, these yeah, voices. Oh, yeah, it's awesome. You know, let, let's get these independent voices in. You know, that's why you have Tennessee Coates, um, you know, doing doing uh, doing Black Panther stuff. <laughs> you know, it's just that that's what you do. OK, uh, real quick uh, programming ideas before I take some more questions here. Um, and again, this is really, really quick. Um, but just some ideas of what to do. First of all, there's free comic book day coming up the first Saturday in May which Ooh. is also this year, May 4th, so it's also Star Wars Oh, Day. that's right. Uh, I hadn't noticed that yet. Uh-oh. All right. If you are interested in doing Free Comic Book Day, uh, the Omaha Public Library now does uh, give out comics every year. We, we participate with a local comic shop, and they order comics for us. Uh, the, the individual comic titles are like 30 to 50 cents a piece. They are dirt, dirt, dirt cheap. Um, you can go to the Diamond uh, Comics distributor website. They have some information on free comic book day. Um, but I would recommend if you have a comic store near you, talk to them and see if they're doing it and see if you can piggyback on their orders if that is something of mm -hmm. interest to you. And now is the time to do it. Uh, you have probably about two weeks um, because the, the shops need to get in their free comic book day orders usually about the third week in, in January. Um, so th this is the time to look at that. If you go to, uh, there is a website, freecomicbookday.com. I'm just going to type it in and see if I get there. Um, well, it helps if I don't put the six in there. <laughs> there it is. Freecomicbookday.com. They just now announced all the different titles for them, and there is a wide variety of titles. There usually is a lot. There's a range from comics for the littlest kids all the way up to um, adult. Yeah. And I like it because yeah. it's a good way to get started on a title you might not be sure you're interested in. A lot of them are want, it's, it's not going to, you're not going to jump into the middle of a story and be like, I have no idea what's going on. A lot of them are one shots or introducing. Right. So. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a really low uh, low cost entry. Oh, lumber lumberjanes, the folks who uh, combined with uh, yeah, cool. yeah, there they are. They have their own free comic book day issued this year. Um, 
but yeah, it's it's a good low uh, low investment way to kind of dip your toe in into uh, comics land without you know having to having to stay there for very long if you if you decide you don't like it. Um, but yeah, free comic day is, is great. It's it's a you know it's a it's a relatively cheap program to run, and also you know it's a good way to kind of uh, increase some some ties into your local community. Um, we're very lucky in Omaha. We have two comic shops that want to work with libraries and are very good with working with libraries. Um, I'm assuming that, you know, those of you who have comic shops in your area, they would be ha more than happy to do the same thing. Uh, but if not, again, go to the Diamond Comics uh, website because, uh, because they do have instructions for libraries who may not be in, in areas with a comic shop. Other programming ideas, comic book crafts. If you are taking your graphic novels and weeding them, save those things. They make incredible decoupage crafts. Uh, you can, you know, obviously everybody's heard about the old, uh, you know, wrap, wrap a present in the newspaper comics. You can do a lot of crafty things like that just by treating the comics pages as fun dec decorative pages. And they're if, colorful. They're usually they're they're multicolor, not just black and white like a newspaper. Right, <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Um, another thing is uh, if you have, and again, this needs an expert to run it, but if you have an expert, you can have a comic or manga drawing club. Um, you know, it could be a weekly or monthly thing. I've tried to get it going three times. I've never quite had the teams um, to do it. The ones who are really, you know, if you have like even three teams that are just really into this, this thing will almost run itself. Um, but again, you do have to have, have to have to have somebody that we, is able to act as an advisor, at least artistically for that. Um, and the last little option I want to throw at you um is something that I've tried and I, I kind of like it. You know, there's so many manga series out there and there are so many, you know, manga series that have like 30 volumes. How do you know which ones your kids want? How, you know, which ones are the best ones? Of course, they should tell you, but you can also do what I call a manga audition book club where the book club reads every month the first volume of a certain manga title. And then you can decide as a book club whether you should continue and get the other volumes. Um, but... That that's worked semi well for me in the past. Uh, again, I didn't have quite quite enough kids to really make it run when I when I ran it. But I think that again with the right group, that would be a really fun book club to do. Mm. Any questions mm. on anything I've covered? Uh, yeah, let's see. Anybody have any questions? Type them in. Um, we have some comments that came in from earlier. Um, the question about the French uh, comics. The um, there, I did find, and I'll, I'll show when I oh here the the French Comics Association is out there that um, brings together some of the major publishers of French comics into one group. So that would be a place to look at. And there's also an international comics festival that um, also has its own awards. And that was one of the recommendations from one of our um, attendees here. Gary says that it might be a good way to you know. Award, look at awards to see what um, is out there. But all I did, I just Googled like French comics and came up with some of these things too. Um, awesome. Also, a comment just so so there is some things out there. Just gotta kind of look for them. Um, also, something does uh, suggest when you're talking about Lumberjanes and other ones, um, Gwenpool, Ms. Marvel, and Champions are excellent Marvel titles and great oh, yes. books for youth to to get started with. Yeah. Yeah, Ms. Marvel, I, I definitely would recommend very highly. Um, Gwenpool is a lot of fun. Uh, there's, there's, you have to know a little bit about the Marvel Universe to understand why Gwenpool even exists, um, but, <laughs> yeah. but it is fun. Um, yeah, Batgirl on DC side is pretty good for, uh, for you know, for yeah. I, I'm always looking at how to get teen girls into it, just mm -hmm. because that that's always kind of the missing marketing piece. Um, although manga is a great pull, that's really where a lot of lot of women uh, got their start in reading graphic novels is through is through the manga gateway. Mm -hmm. um, and again, a lot of these like Hope Larson and a lot of these independent creators, like I said, they were manga readers growing up. Mm -hmm. That's the independent voices of today are the manga readers of the past. I, I read a lot of uh, comics that are, uh, I try to look for ones, and not, I'm not specific, to, that are written or drawn by female artists as well. Mm -hmm. And um, that's and, honestly a huge movement right now. Oh, um, it is, yes. You know, the, the, it's, and it's really great to see, too. Uh, Gail Simone is Gail one of Simone, my favorites. And, yeah. She's a great writer, yeah. Yeah. Um, then, yeah, that, on artist-wise, Amanda, Amanda Connor is great. Um, 
she she's the one that that helps Gail Simone with a lot of stuff, especially like the Harley, Harley Quinn stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to think of. Uh, Oh, Vera Broxel is the other one that I was thinking of that's kind of in that group. Uh, she did a book called Anya's Ghost, and she is doing um, other – she's doing stories now mainly for the younger group, like the the third through sixth graders. Um, but, yeah, it's – this is an exciting time to collect graphic novels because there's just so mm-hmm. much out there for all different age groups and all different voices out there, which oh, is a big – also G. Willow Wilson, too. She's doing yes, a lot of great things. Yeah, she is. Um, she is the writer of Ms. Marvel, and I believe DC's asked her to start writing Wonder Woman too. Yeah. So that, so that should be fun. Um, I mean, yeah, she I mean, is. She is a converted uh, Muslim, so you get that voice in there, which is just. I mean, it's really. Even even from ten years ago, the the, the voices that are doing even the mainstream comics are so much more diverse. Uh, than they were, you know, it really was kind of an old white guys club for a long, long, long time. And now, now it's not. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we do have some, uh, questions here. All right. Um, <laughs> any good resources for catalogers, uh, when it comes to determining how to create call numbers for these, all of these, uh, comic series? Oof. um, do you do and the cataloging? <laughs> I don't do the cataloging, although, you know, this this has come up in discussions in in what is now the ground it, the graphic novel roundtable for ALA. Mm-hmm. Um, I've I've heard this discussion about four or five times over the years. You kind of have to de- decide as a system how you're cataloging graphic novels. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's a few different ways you can do it. You can do strictly by Dewey, which means you're all going to end up in the 700s and your 750s and 740s are going to be a huge section. Um, you, what we do at the Omaha library, it seems to work well for us is we treat them more like a fiction book where we will put the author's name. We will do it first by the author's name, unless it's a multi-author set. And then we will do it by the series name. Um, and not always do we do that. Sometimes, sometimes different series are just with the author's names. If, if different authors have taken over and done different stories arcs. Um, that's the problem you run into with that is if you go by author, then you might split up series. Um, the other way is strictly by series, but that really, uh, will lead you into confusion pretty quickly, I think. But those are the three strategies I've seen. Um, and again, you have to decide as a system, I think really, what is the best fit for your library? Hmm. <clears throat> True. Yeah. Um, someone also suggests, um, um, section 741.5 because it's art. Right. You go in there. Um, so, and as well says, we have them like fiction, unless they are nonfiction content comics popping mm-hmm. up, which are popping up more and more. Yeah. And, and we do that. We do that as well at Omaha. We, we put the nonfiction comics in the nonfiction section. Mm-hmm. Um, we will assign them a Dewey number and we might keep them with the graphic novels area if, if all those are together. Um, but you know, we also, I don't think we would be opposed to interfiling them if, if that's the, you know, if that's how it worked out. Mm-hmm. Um, but we do we do slap a Dewey number on on the nonfiction ones. Mm-hmm. And then someone has a question, which is interesting. And this is I think it's uh, leading towards many libraries changing how they are uh, arranging their libraries. Um, have you ever considered uh, arranging them by publisher and characters, similar to how the comic book stores do it? It's I I have not personally, um, mm-hmm. and I don't I Go don't have the uh, I don't have the mojo to make that make library. that work. Um, I've heard of people trying that. I have not heard whether it works for them or not. In in a library, yes. yeah. Yeah, in a library. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, I mean, I guess you have to see how it goes. Yeah, I mean, when you're going into a comic shop, you're assuming most of the people coming in there, that's, that's the only thing you've got in there, and they know what they're looking for or they know how they're looking for it. You know, I'm interested in Wonder Woman. Oh, well, they're all here. Or I love everything published by Boom Comics. All right, I'm going here. Or a particular artist, like I mentioned, Gail Simone or someone. Um, Right, right. You've got to figure out how you're doing things. (laughs) (laughs) It depends on who the people are coming in and what they're asking for. And you might change it, obviously. as, As your collection gets bigger and becomes more of a thing, that might be a way to go. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really would love to hear from – I know there have been a couple of libraries that did that kind of by genre or by, by company mm-hmm. sort of thing. 
I have not heard how it went for them though. And I would, I'm really curious to see that too, or hear about yeah. that too. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Well, you did mention one. Um, someone wants to know, do you recommend any books about comics? You had um, that previous one, you one that you did. Yeah. The understanding, the understanding comics. Yeah. Um, are there others? There are a few. Uh, Grant Morrison did an interesting memoir called Super Gods, uh, where he actually ties his religion into it. Mm. Um, but he, he kind of—it's kind of a personal memoir of his time in comics. Um, mm. There's not a lot written about comics that don't end up being an instructional how to do comics book. That's yeah. That's what I keep thinking of is like <clears throat> how to write a comic, how to draw comics. <laughs> You know, and, and there, there are some good versions of that. Will Eisner does a few, few really great uh, kind of comics theory books, um, but he doesn't talk about actual titles or, or you know, actual uh, titles or anything. It's more along the lines of the Scott McCloud book, where it's kind of the comics theory. Um, hmm. I really, I really don't know of any books that are are particularly talking about comics. Although, wait a minute, I just thought of one. Of course, all the people that are in the round table. Um, let me see if this is in our catalog. I'm not sure if we even have it. No, I don't think we do. Uh, I'm just going to Google her because her name is Snow Wild Smith, and she did do a book on graphic novel reviews. And, and so did uh, Robin Brenner, who runs the... No Flying, No Tights um, website, as well as, yeah, she also does a lot of, uh, there, that's the one I'm thinking of. Parents Guide to the Best Kids Comics, Choosing Titles Your Children Will Love. By there you go, oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you're looking for, yeah. Um, and if you do this, I actually did just a Google search, uh, not a Google, an Amazon search, too, on history of comics. And there are some, there's always the ones that are like the of, of a particular character or DC. Or right, something. right. Yeah, they do I, a lot I, of character more, studies. More general. Yeah, there's some things out there. Understanding comics, the invisible art. And that's the Scott McCloud again. Scott McCloud, yeah. Um, Robert, oh, Oh, well, yeah, books. There's the Robert Kirkman series that was a TV show. on The, walk, the Walking Dead? Well, yeah. No, <laughs> he did The Secret History of Comics. Oh, that's right. Okay, yeah. yeah I'm he sorry, did. you're asking for books, but that is a history thing. So if you look, look for that as something to watch, if you're into that, yeah. But there are some things out there, yeah. Yeah, and it's it's kind of um, intermittent. I, I honestly, that would be a great thing to ask the roundtable because a lot of those folks have written those books. Mm -hmm. um, and here's one that someone actually in the in our audience suggests. Hannah suggests um, graphic novels and comics in libraries and archives: essays on readers, research, history, and cataloging, by Robert Weiner, etc. Mm -hmm. So there is one specifically for libraries. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I believe he I believe he's part of the roundtable. See. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, and we have another. I'll just. Uh, ooh. Ten Cent Plague is something about comic censorship. There's a yes, video. yes, uh, that that was that was written about the uh, congressional hearings and and the American mm -hmm. the, the Comics Code Authority back in the fifties. About the history of it, yeah, definitely. Um, I just want to say to everyone, we are at eleven o two, but we will um, finish with anybody's questions or anything else that Russ wants to say. We do not have to be cut off here at eleven a.m. just because that's when we officially go um, our schedule for. So um, we'll keep going as long as you have questions or comments, and as long as Russ wants to chat. Um, if you do need to leave because you only allotted, you know, scheduled yourself to eleven o'clock to watch the show, um, that's fine. We are recording, and you all get access to the archive afterwards. Um, let's see. We do have one question, another question here um, that they said they are also reading about some public libraries using Hoopla, which allows for digital comics. Mm -hmm. Do you see this trend growing? Is there a demand for comics delivered digitally in the library, like with eBooks? I personally do. Um, we have looked at Hoopla here. The pricing structure is not quite right for our library, mm -hmm. um, but we do have some comics that are available through one of Hoopla's competitors, which is Overdrive. Right. Uh, they both um, do it. Yeah. yeah, they those those don't work quite as nicely as the Hoopla app, but they do exist. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, I, I think that digital comics 
it, those are those are going to continue to be a thing, and I think libraries would be very silly not to look at that somehow mm -hmm. um, as far as adding that sort of <clears throat> content to their collection. Yeah, and obviously it's becoming something new because now also someone, Hannah here, is saying RB Digital is also introducing comic books now as right. well. So definitely it is becoming, everybody wants things, you know, right away and they, the digital and eBooks is, is so convenient for some people yeah. um, that definitely these publishers, the e, e publishers know they need to get on board with it. There are of course the individual um, comics, like DC has its own digital and Marvel, yeah. but that's just a one publisher. These are more, these yeah. ways would be better to go for a library as far as here's a whole bunch of different ones that you can access through one of these uh, sources. Right. Yeah. Commercially, um, if you're not talking about libraries, uh, there's an app called Comicsology that, that pretty much yes. handles all the, all the digital stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, libraries, yeah, they, they, they've got the new thing from R RB digital and then yeah, Hoopla and Overdrive have already been doing that for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I do think that, yeah, that's people, people will want th those digitally, just like they want eBooks digitally. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. If that's what they're used, that's how they're using the library. Sure. Um, any other questions you have, get them typed in, we'll get them answered or any, uh, suggestions you have for, um, where to get comics or programming that you guys have done. I'd like to hear if anybody has done any other programming in their libraries related to it. Um, Someone else does have a comment. Well, I'll mention here while we're waiting, so anyone has any that uh, when we were talking about suggestions for young um, people, uh, the creators of the later New 52 run of Batgirl have a series called Motor Crush that is also very good and appeals to young and queer girls. Cool. I have not gotten into that one yet. That mm -hmm. sounds very cool. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, okay. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this, this next question is kind of, uh, the first part of the question confused me because you've got your Jigglypuff on your shoulder there <laughs> in your picture, Because and someone starts off saying, can you explain Pokemon to me? And I'm like, that's a whole other show. Ooh, yeah. But then she says, are they sequential? I think she's talking about Pokemon comics. Mm -hmm. Are they sequential or standalone within the various series? I don't know much about them other than kids love them, and I don't know what series to pick up. So talking about Pokemon comics, not the Pokemon game. Which is right, right, right. Um, we actually have done a show on Pokemon Go in libraries. If you're interested, check our archives. <laughs> Anyhow. <laughs> um, yeah, the Pokemon the Pokemon stuff reads just pretty much like any other uh, Japanese manga. The, the volume numbers um, are sequential. I know there's at least four different Pokemon series out there. Wow. Um, I, I don't know that's, which is the yeah, most current, I'll be honest. Yeah. But yeah, if they they do go sequentially from volume one all the way up through whatever the last volume is of that of that particular title. Mm -hmm. You might have just pick one, or maybe ask your kids which character do you like. I don't know. Yeah, and you know we'll they all, they all have their different favorite which, Pokemon, and I suppose yeah. it, I suppose it depends on you know which characters in the manga also like that Pokemon, you yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. Um. Oh, someone. Oh, someone did. As I was asking about programming, someone says they did a manga conference. How it became popular throughout the world. Oh, cool. So that's like a, a more sounds like a more in depth thing. Yeah, that's something yeah. I was actually wondering about about um. Programming, you did mention getting someone to come in and like do a a, a demo, whatever, on art, doing the mm -hmm. actual how to draw. Um, now you said, Russ, that you do some of your own artwork, and I've seen that okay. through your um, Twitter and everything. But that would be something too, I think. Um, look for if there are any local artists in your community that are writing their own independent. I mean, here in Lincoln, we have a couple of different comic shops and they do bring in some of the um, local artists that they know of because they already are, you know, they're coming to the comic book shop saying, hey, will you sell my, my independently published thing? Um, but they would be definitely willing to go into libraries. I'm sure I know I've seen some of them at our Barnes and Noble going there and doing like drawing demonstrations on free comic book day or Batman day or whatever. Um, but that could be something too, not necessarily manga uh, specific, but just comic drawing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, any artists and, and honestly, I have yet to see, you know, many comic artists that do that, that don't want to go out and, and meet fans or yeah. meet potential people and so yeah if you know somebody like that that's like an almost instant draw for for a library program 
Definitely. Yeah, they want to see the actual artist. I mean, you can't get, you know, probably can't get Gail Simone to come, but, <laughs> but you never know. Um, but you definitely want to, you know, boost up the local artists like you do your local authors of books. Mm -hmm same thing and if you're not sure i would recommend because i know i keep seeing these posted on the comic book shops pages reach out to them and say can you connect me with whoever right um and along those lines um you've got I, coming I, in along those lines i did not mention this specific spe excuse me specifically for programming because it it's a little more than just a simple program but a lot of libraries have many uh, comics conventions at some point. Yes, many Comic Cons, yes. Yeah, and that's another way to go. I have never personally organized one, so I don't feel qualified about how to make one go. Um, but I do know that the, there there are publications on that, and there are plenty of other librarians that you can use as a resource for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's kind of thing you can just you know do a Google on Library yeah. Comic Con. Um, we actually it sounds like this a lot, um, but uh, we did an Encompass Live about that back in 2016, organizing a successful <laughs> comic or maker con at your library. There we go. So we do have a show about that, but um, you can look for there's lots more um, places out there that have done it. Um, Let's see. Someone else is there including comics and their radio book critiques that they do radio um, uh, book reviews. Oh, great. Um, oh, another another book someone recommended is Marvel Comics: The Untold Story. Uh, by uh, Les. How? Yeah. Believe. Um. And. Yeah. Uh, he did one for Marvel, and there's there's a similar one about DC too. Mm -hmm. I don't know the exact title of it. Yeah. Um, and so it's also just including when you do a general display on a topic of whatever, throw in your comics or your graphic novels as just another type of material we have on this topic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to like, you be sneaky, I guess is the way to, <laughs> doesn't have to be specifically, here's our comics, but hey, here's a, here's a, um, well, a, a thing on the Holocaust and of course yeah. stick in there, but you know, anything else. Yeah. And, and honestly, sometimes the comic is the best way to convey that information. Um, to people learn very different in different ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To um, you know, back about 15 years ago, two Marvel um, veteran comic artists and and writers actually took the government's published 9/11 report commission report and made it into a graphic novel work. And yeah. honestly, it was. Ten times more understandable <laughs> than, than the silly report well, was. It has to be, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so, so they, they do have uses, you know, beyond what you would think, and then that I mean, that always strikes me as like the perfect example of, you know, the form fitting the message. Because mm -hmm. that that other. I've looked through that other thing and you just get confused. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to. Um, and I think we'll just do this one last comment here since we are getting about 10 after and I wanted to um, mention this too. Someone said um, Emerald, Emerald City Comic Con is mm -hmm. held in Seattle and they held panels at the Seattle Public Library specifically aimed at librarians. So cool. um, that was like the actual real, you know, official Comic-Con just for that said, hey, we're gonna connect with libraries. And I know that at the like um, San Diego Comic-Con and New York Comic-Con, they do have, they now have panels um, that come not going to the library, but coming to actual Comic-Con about, of librarians. I know librarians who are actually participating in panels at those, the big guy Comic-Cons talking about comics and libraries and how that all works and with education and everything. So it is definitely becoming the comics industry from their side is recognizing libraries. Yeah, as and they, something they really that are. They are wanting to encourage and and uh, let people know about and work with. And for the last few years, uh, there has been a librarian on the Eisner Awards Committee too. There so. You go. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Oh, and she says, oh, this I didn't know. Cookbooks are starting to make appearances in comic format. Ooh. Yes. Yeah. All right. So it's everywhere. Yes, <laughs> it, it, it literally is everywhere. Um, you know, I used to say about Japanese manga, they're a manga for housewives, they're a manga for plumbers, they're a manga for salarymen, they're a manga for janitors. You literally, you can find almost any subject these days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So I think I think we'll wrap it up now. We've had a lot of good discussion here. I'm so glad to have you on here, Russ. Um, My pleasure. I enjoyed it. 
Yeah, especially with the whole history of of the comics, I know that's something that some people may or may not know everything about it, or might know little pieces. Um, but that was great to hear about. We got some great ideas here, and I'm glad everyone was able to join us uh, with this this morning. I am going to pull back control to my screen here. All righty. Just to um, show you some things that I brought up here. So, all right. So here is, this is just the session page for Jay's. And I mentioned earlier, we do have the handout and the presentation list done there. The archive recording will be there as well. And I'll send you guys a link to that when it's ready um, sometime today or tomorrow or when this all gets processed. Um, I just want to mention some, show you some things that we did mention during the show. Uh, the uh, Facebook page for the ALA Graphic Novels and Comics Libraries Roundtable. It's just a group there you can join. It's a public group. I'm a member of it, and they just, you know, are um, posting anything related to it if you're not in ALA or part of that. Uh, so we were talking about the French Comics. The French Comics Association is one that I found, and the um, Comic Festival that is held in Europe is here as well. So um, those are some things that you can look at. Um, as well. So uh, that will wrap it up for today's show. I'm going to get back to our main page here. And as I said, the archive will be done and posted uh, hopefully this afternoon, maybe tomorrow. We'll see. It depends on how GoToWebinar and, and YouTube cooperate with me on that. <laughs> um, as soon as it is ready, everyone who attended today and everyone who um, registered, even if they weren't able to attend live, will get an email from me to let you know that it's ready um, for you to watch. Um, where it will be is here. This is our Encompass Live site, and we have our upcoming shows here, but um, right underneath here is a link to our archived Encompass Live shows, the most recent one at the top of the list. Here's last week's topic was best new teen books of 2018 where we would add a link to the recording along with um, the handout and presentation that Russ has already provided to us. Um, while I'm here I'll just, just talk about our archives briefly. Uh, we are uh, we do have 10 years worth of archives now in here in 2018 last year was the 10th year of our show Encompass Live and we do have our archives going all the way back so uh, this is a long long page but we now have where you can search the archives for a topic a name of someone and you can search everything or just the re most recent 12 months if you want something just more um, up to date. So do keep that in mind as you are searching or look through our archives that we will have some things here. Everything has a date on it. If I scroll down here, here's things from 2016, for example, um, that when you're looking at something, the information may be old, it may be out of date, the service or whatever it is may not exist anymore because it was from eight, nine, ten years ago. But we are librarians, so we save and archive historically everything. So everything will always still be up there. Just uh, uh, keep that in mind. You pay attention when you're watching something. Oh, hey, there's our Pokemon Go that I was mentioning. Anyway. <laughs> So that is our archives. Um, and I hope you'll join us next week when our topic is our 2019 One Book, One Nebraska, the ble This Blessed Earth, A Year in the Life of an American Family Farm. Farm. Uh, the author, Ted Genoways, will be here with us at the Nebraska Library Commission to talk about his book and to talk about the One Book, One Nebraska program. Uh, this is the book that everyone in the state is reading for this year. This is one we we're actually doing jointly with Iowa, with all Iowa reads. They are also reading the same book. Uh, this is because this fall in October, our state library conferences, Nebraska and Iowa, we were doing a joint library conference. So we decided to also do a joint One Book, One State um, title. And we were able to find one that actually covers would be good for both states. Sometimes it's hard to find, you know, is it just Nebraska, just Iowa? This one is about American family farming. So definitely sign up and join us next week uh, to hear uh, Ted talk about his a book and for us to talk about the One Book, One Nebraska and all Iowa Reads programs coming up. Uh, and please do sign up for any of our other upcoming shows. See, I've got some listed here. I've got more coming up for the end of January. Don't worry, we're going to get everything on the schedule there, just finalizing some things. Uh, and lastly, Encompass Live is also on Facebook. We do have a Facebook page. If you are a big user of Facebook, uh, give us a like over there. We remind people of when to, uh, shows are coming up. Here's a uh, show, a reminder about today's show. Log in right now. And when um, recordings are available of previous shows, we post on here as well. Where's the previous one? There we go. So uh, if you do like to use Facebook, give us a like over there to keep up with what we're doing. Other than that, thank you so much for being here with us, Russ. Thank you for having me. Great. We learned a lot, I think. We got a lot of thanks coming through on the chat as well. And hopefully you'll all join us next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Take care.